Hello. So, um, I wanted to talk um, in this video a little bit about um, certain weapons found in Afghanistan. Um, in the 19th century, the British military, British army, um, spent a lot of time in Afghanistan for various reasons, for, for good and bad. Um, we won't enter into the politics of it. Um, but essentially Afghanistan was an important area strategically, being above India and uh, below Russia. Um, and um, the uh, British military several times throughout, uh, from the middle of the 19th century, uh, through right the way through into the beginning of the 20th century, um, invaded Afghanistan for various reasons. Um, and therefore um, encountered a lot of uh, both alliances and conflict um, with various different tribal groups within Afghanistan. So the first thing to say about the area is that um, then as now, uh, it wasn't a homogenous region containing uh, one particular nationality or group. It was made up of essentially tribal groups, uh, for example, Pathans and Baluchis and Afghans and so on. Um, however, they did, they were ruled over by, uh, by, one, um, by one ruler, so that's essentially what, uh, what gave us the modern idea of Afghanistan, but they were many different groups that were similar in their uh, languages and uh, beliefs and culture, and therefore similar in their warfare and weapons. Um, and at various times they allied together to fight against the British, but some groups, particularly the Pathans and the Baluchis um, and the Afridis, uh, sometimes provided soldiers for the British Army and fought against, um, for example, uh, the rebels during the Indian Mutiny and so on. So um, the British military uh, had a lot of uh, experience, and still does, with, uh, with um, Afghan uh, nationals of various types um, and their weapons. Um, and uh, this meant that they were allies and enemies, and therefore they um, experienced their weapons to a large degree. Now, many of you may have heard of uh, the most famous of um, Afghan weapons, known as the Khyber knife, uh, named after the, the Khyber Pass and the, the region of the Khyber. Um, and essentially it was a long knife, and this is one. This is an original uh, 19th century, probably from uh, estimating from the 1880s, 1890s, probably probably brought back to Britain then. Um, and uh, they're actually not uncommon things to find in Britain because of the uh, lengthy period of time that, uh, that Britain has spent in Afghanistan over the last 150 years. But um, equally, of course, because India, um, India was British for a long period of time and lots of things were brought back from India to Britain uh, and lots of Afghan weapons found their way into India. Uh, and that's an important thing to mention as well, that the northwest frontier of India was always quite uh, a, a troubled uh, area and there was always lots of conflict there and so all sorts of things, including weapons, moved fairly freely through that region. Indian weapons found their way into Afghanistan and of course Afghan weapons found their way uh, south into, into India. Um, equally British weapons found their way both ways, and it, British rifles for example and um, artillery pieces and so on. Um, so the, the fabled and feared Khyber knife, what is it? Essentially it's not that different from a large butcher's knife. Um, it, it is really just a big knife but there are a few peculiar features of its design to talk about. Um, firstly it has no real guard, hand guard to speak of. It has, it has a, a sort of feral, a guard area, but it doesn't really protect your hand other than the fact that the blade is as wide as, as your hand is on the grip. Okay? Um, the grips themselves are, are connected to the, to the tang in, and they're usually made of uh, horn, incidentally. Sometimes made of other things, wood or sometimes metal, but usually they're horn. Um, and they are riveted by two or three, usually rivets, um, through exactly like your uh, kitchen knife will be. Okay, so in construction, quite similar to a large kitchen knife. Uh, they also usually have this little projecting piece out of the back end of the pommel, and usually it has a hole through it, although not always. Um, as to what's that, what is that for? Probably it's for connecting a silk or some other material cord through to loop your uh, hand through and prevent loss of the weapon. Although that's not certain and, and I'm not 100% certain and I'm not sure that anybody these days in modern times is 100% certain what, what that is for. Um, 
The blade itself is locally made, steel, probably, um, probably traded in in most cases by the 19th century. Um, and uh, it's hand forged, you can usually see uh, forged lines in the blade um, and uh, they're usually not fantastic quality steel. From personal experience of, of having quite a lot of antique ones of these, um, just to demonstrate, I have another one almost identical just here and I've got, I have yet another one as well. Um, uh, they are not, they're not great quality and I have known there to be bent ones and I have straightened them by hand. So in my experience, they are not spring hardened and tempered like a European blade would be. Um, they're actually quite soft in the body, but probably with a hardened edge, somewhat similar to Japanese swords, but it has to be said also similar to many uh, tools rather than weapons. So right away in Europe, going back to the medieval period, it's very common to take a, a chef's knife, for example, and you only quench the edge, you only harden the edge, because what that means is you're, you're keeping a soft back and a hard edge, and you're not risking uh, cracking the blade during the quenching process or deforming it or anything else. So it's a low risk and fairly easy way to give it a slightly harder or a fairly harder edge. Okay, um, uh, a feature of the blade that um, is immediately noticeable, uh, I don't know if you can see it very well on the camera, I'll try and reflect the light off, is that down the back of Kyber knife blades um, is a, essentially a, a flat section, so it's a T section. So you have a flat blade and then a T section at the back. What that does is it adds weight to the, to the knife, so when you chop with it, um, it's got a lot more weight in the blade than, than it would have otherwise, but in, most importantly, it stiffens it. It's, it's very similar uh, principle to a, an eye girder or eye beam in a building. It makes the blade less likely to bend when you're hitting someone. Uh, they taper to a point, although I'll talk a bit about the point in a second, and the edges, in my experience, are always very sharp, very well sharpened, and they are kept in a wood and leather scabbard, so they, they remain sharp, they stay sharp. Um, and they have a, a bevel, so you have a flat blade, and then, I don't know if you can see that on the camera, but you then have a bevel to the, to the final edge, and it's um, probably the angle at which the, the planes of the edge meet, it's probably only about 25 degrees, something like that, so it's quite a thin, fine edge. It's not going to take a lot of abuse on the edge. Um, and these were used either on their own, um, and they were worn edge up usually, edge up, edge down actually, both are shown, um, in a long wooden scabbard, which unfortunately I don't have an example of, uh, tucked into the sash, um, and clearly it's a fairly short, convenient weapon uh, that leaves your hands free, it's not going to get in the way of anything. Uh, their main weapon, incidentally, was usually um, a, a musket of various sorts, usually a matchlock musket, um, uh, and sometimes particularly long versions known as jezails, uh, which were rifled, and they were actually very accurate, um, but fairly slow rate of fire because uh, slow to reload um, and potentially unreliable in rain because it's a matchlock, so open to the elements and so on. Um, but the the Kyber knife um, itself is a, a you know quite a, a utilitarian, short, convenient weapon to carry around, and uh, was quite feared um, by British soldiers and had quite a um, quite a reputation for dealing quite nasty wounds. Now, at that point, talking about the wounds, we are very lucky to have from the 19th century a description by a British uh, military surgeon of uh, wounds that soldiers receive in war, and he specifically talks about these weapons, which is a, a great boon, really. Um, he talks about how they were used and the wounds that they usually give. And an interesting thing that he points out is that while Steve gave really nasty slashing wounds, they, uh, as we know and we talked about in previous videos, slashing wounds often, unless you're unlucky and it hits an artery or removes a limb, um, are, are often not fatal. And what he says is, um, amazingly, they hardly ever, and in fact I think he says never, um, use the point of the weapon to thrust. And he says if they thrust with it, they would cause more fatal wounds. Although, as we've seen in previous videos, they may not be, be more incapacitating wounds. And this is backed up, corroborated by other sources that say the same thing. That Afghans in the 19th century used these as slashing and cleaving weapons. Um, I should also add that they often used it in, co in conjunction with a shield. Um, 
usually usually about uh, two foot in diameter, uh, made of hide, thick hide leather, domed, uh, much like a, an Indian shield, in fact almost identical to an Indian shield, uh, known as a dal in India. I don't know what the Afghan word is, I'm afraid. Um, what were these called in their native language? They were known as Chora or Chara. Um, so C-H-O-O-R-A or C-H-A-R-A-H, usually written in English. Uh, so if you're searching in 19th century sources, uh, search for Chora or Chara or Kyber knife. Uh, and in Britain these were most no normally known as Kyber knives. Um, so this wasn't the only uh, hand weapon carried by Afghans in the 19th century, uh, although it was the most famous and it was very common. Um, people who could afford it bought a tulwar, okay? Um, and there were lots of Indian tulwars of the typical Indian design, usually probably from uh, Sikh areas and the Punjab um, in Afghanistan, but equally the Afghans had their own style of tulwar, which they called polwar, um, which is usually in English spelt P-O-U-L AR, I believe, um, and the only way it differs really, usually the blade is exactly the same, the only way it differs is the hilt design and the, uh, the extensions of the cross guard here, the quillons, actually usually curve downwards slightly on an Afghan one and the pommel, rather than being flat, is usually a, um, a dome, uh, like half a, half a sphere with a flat here and the rounded part towards the hand. So that's actually interesting because what I talked about to all previously and it um, causing you to hold this grip uh, that keeps almost a right angle between the arm and the blade, uh, with the polar pommel it actually allows you to extend the blade more comfortably. So it seems like perhaps the, the Afghans weren't cutting in exactly the same way as they were in, uh, in the Punjab and other parts of India. Um, they did also in Afghanistan very high status people often had Persian, uh, i.e. modern Iran, um, or, or other Middle Eastern um, Shamshir uh, and quite you know, expensive swords from the Middle East, if they could afford it, but that was really top echelon of society. Um, and the last type of Afghan weapon to mention is known as the Pesh Kabs. Now, something to mention about the scabbard of this is this scabbard, it looks very, very similar to the scabbard for the uh, large Kyber knife. Um, but this has a scabbard, unfortunately I don't have a, a, a scabbard for the Kyber knife. Um, and what we've got here is essentially a thrusting dagger. I'll just put the scabbard down. And uh, it's usually a very narrow blade, usually a very thick blade again with this T-section uh, rib along the back. Uh, a sharp edge, but the most important thing about this blade is its point and they're very, very, very sharp and very, very stiff. And for those of you who know medieval European weapons, it's very similar uh, use and purpose to a rondel dagger. So it has a reinforced point, uh, a thin, relatively thin, narrow, very stiff, uh, quite thick blade. And if you look at the grip, uh, you can hold it point up, but most illustrations show it point down and usually with the thumb on the pommel. And these seem to have developed because in Afghanistan the wearing of armour was still quite common even up until the, the middle of the 19th century. Um, and it seems that these were used um, not just for stabbing unarmoured people, which I'm sure they would do adequately, uh, perfectly well, um, but also for stabbing and perhaps bursting male armour. And it's worth also mentioning that uh, Middle Eastern and uh, Asian male is usually not riveted like European male, it's usually just butted rings. Uh, so, so opening those rings and thrusting a point in is going to be easier. Although um, Asian and Middle Eastern male tends to be of smaller links, which is perhaps one of the reasons it's not riveted. Um, but anyway, it's essentially an anti-armour dagger, and you do find broader bladed types of these that are probably not so much for fighting armour, but just for stabbing regular people. Um, so there we go, the main Afghan hand weapons are the Kyber knife, which we saw first, um, known as the Chora or Chada, um, the uh, Tulwar, Indian Tulwar, the Afghan version, which is the Pulwa, um, sometimes the Shamshir, um, which uh, is more Middle Eastern design, Persian design, um, and lastly the Pesh Kabs, which is the short dagger, uh, probably designed as an anti-armour weapon originally. Thank you very much.